Good morning. Welcome to week four of NanoSenge Chem 134. Um, I hope you uh, are still in the class after the exam, and I see that you are, so that's fantastic. Um, today and Wednesday will be the last two days of pretty much anything related to chemical structures. Um, so if you uh, were not comfortable with all of the organic chemistry in the beginning part of the class, the first third of the class, it will, be, it will all be over soon. Um, and then we'll move on to thermodynamics, so kind of the chemical, physical, physical chemical uh, principles. So how um, a regular solution theory of two solvents translates to a solvent and a polymer and a polymer and a polymer, how that influences the molecular structure and ultimately the thermomechanical behavior of, uh, of polymers. So today we are going to introduce and cover most of the idea of, of ionic polymerization, which is the other key method of chain growth polymerization. So it produces products that are in many cases similar to those produced by radical polymerization, except that the process is mediated either by, uh, mediated by pairs of electrons instead of single electrons, that is, radicals. So if we have a positive charge on the active center or the growing end of the polymer chain, we call that cationic polymerization. If it's a negative charge that's attacking the next monomer and creating the polymer, then that is anionic uh, polymerization. So this is ionic polymerization. These reactions uh, all proceed by chain growth. So it gives you products like those produced by radical polymerization. So that is products that have the polyolefinic shape. Uh, this sort of zigzag uh, motif where we have X groups and so on. But we can also do anionic polymerization of rings to give us ring opened pol polymers that, that are the result of ring opening polymerization. And one example is the polymerization of ethylene oxide that gives us polyethylene oxide. So we have two types. If it's a positive charge at the active center, then that is called cationic. If it's negative charge, we call that anionic. And the cool thing about anionic polymerization is that it is truly living. Truly living. I, I almost said something that I shouldn't have. <laughs> Suddenly I had that thought about a hundred times. <laughs> Screw it. What do I mean by truly with no E living? <laughs> uh, 
It means that in radical polymerization, you can't exclude the possibility of termination by combination or dispro disproportionation. You can reduce it down to a vanishingly small probability, but it still will eventually happening, happen. That's a great truth in science and statistics. Anything with a finite probability of happening when integrated over an infinite amount of time will happen an infinite number of times. Yeah. How is an anion different from a free radical? An anion is, it, a free radical is not formally charged if it's balanced by the appropriate number of protons in the molecular structure. But an anion is formally charged and it usually takes the form of, uh, of an extra electron. So you have, a, an, you have unbonded, but a pair of, a pair of unbonded electrons. <coughs> so it's like, uh, anyone remember formal charge from first semester chemistry, first quarter chemistry? So if you get an, a formal charge of negative one on an atom, and it's not balanced anywhere else in the molecule, then that's an anion. Okay, so in the case of anionic polymerization, since you can't have two negative charges combine, um, this, is, this lives forever. You can just keep adding in monomers. Uh, so if, but you can terminate it quite easily just by breathing the smallest amount of water or water vapor or water in the, in the sidewalls of your reaction vessel into the reaction and that will kill it. So let's start with cationic. And we will start with uh, alkenes and then we'll briefly mention uh, ring opening me mechanisms. We need first a strong acid, HA. Ha! Which dissociates to H plus plus uh, A minus. And our requirement for A minus is that it's a non-reactive conjugate base. So it could be a, a big, a big base, big conjugate base that's charge is so delocalized that it's comfortable being a negative charge and doesn't want to react. Uh, with anything. So if we have a vinyl monomer, we have this floppy pair of pi electrons that is existing above and below the plane of the board. And what happens is that this floppy pair of electrons in the pi cloud reacts uh, with, the, uh, with the hydrogen ion, which is just a, just kind of a proton that hops from one solvent molecule to another, doesn't really have a, a permanent um, electron cloud around it, so it's, uh, it's, as, it's as positively charged as things get. Very unscientific way of saying it, but that's what it is. So now we have the positive charge, and this is a carbocation or carbenium ion. <coughs> And now that we have this positive charge on a carbon atom, what happens is that these electrons now react here. And ultimately, the chain propagates to give you a polyolefinic compound uh, like this that has a positive charge um, at the end. So this is the, this is all propagation. This is initiation.
Yes. Is it common to see the reaction happening at the primary carbon? And if so, the, how do you control it so that it only reacts to form it that way? Good question. The question is, why do you get the positive charge at the secondary carbon and not the, not the primary carbon? Is it common to see it happening at the primary carbon? So the question is, why did I draw it with the positive charge here and not here? And, is, and because this happens most of the time, and the reason is because, the, uh, because secondary and tertiary carbocations are more stable than primary ones, and the reason is because uh, positive and negative charges, and this goes beyond what we need to know here, but positive and negative charges exist in an sp2 hybridized carbon atom, and it's easier for electron density from surrounding atoms to donate into the positive charge as a means of lowering its electrostatic potential energy. So they all form on the secondary carbon and no, it's not common for them to form on the primary carbon. Did I eventually get there? Yes. Okay. Okay, what is the role of X? Actually, that question leads directly into my next point is what, it, yes. Did I spell something else wrong? Oh, no. no, okay. Uh, it's not a radical. It's an un. Uh, it, it is a an absence of a pair of electrons. Professor? Yep. I thought a radical was an absence of a pair of electrons, like a single unpaired electron. A radical is one missing electron. Something with a formal charge. Like a, like a chlorine atom is a radical. A chlorine ion has an extra electron and therefore an extra lone pair of electrons that is associated with the, with the negative charge of the chlorine ion. Yeah. Could you uh, potentially redirect the positive charge to the primary carbon if you were to use, say, an uh, uh, electron four substituent as X? Or would that reaction? Uh, they, have to, they all have to be electron poor. This is, the X substituents always have to be electron poor um, in order to, uh, I'm sorry, they have to be electron, they have to be electron rich in order to stabilize the positive charge. So the reaction wouldn't happen with electron poor? The reaction would not happen with an electron poor system, correct. But an anionic polymerization would happen with an electron poor system. So what is the role uh, of X? X should be electron donating. <coughs> donating. To stabilize the positive charge. So if we look at the rates of propagation for vinyl X of O methyl, this is a methyl ether, is greater than this para methoxy phenyl substituent is better than just plain styrene is better than butadiene. So ultimately what you need here is a lot of pi electrons, electrons that can donate into the, uh, into the double bond system uh, oxygen atoms are good because they have two lone pairs of electrons that form what's called a resonance structure that can stabilize the positive charge. What kind of acid catalyst do we want to use?
So typical acids are okay, but they're not, uh, not preferred. Okay, spelled wrong intentionally. HCl, H2SO4, methane, sulfonic acid. But uh, generally, a Lewis acid with a little bit of water added is a much more powerful, uh, much more powerful acid to get this uh, reaction going. So if we have BF3, boron, boron trifluoride, or best friends forever, forever. <laughs> plus H2O. And there doesn't have to be a lot of water in the system, just enough to activate the Lewis acid. We get this super strong Lewis acid complex. And this is only activated in the presence of a little bit of water. The BF3 alone will not, uh, will not initiate the reaction. So how about the role of the non-reactive conjugate base? And this is the counter ion. Or sometimes you will see Jejun ion. I have no idea what that comes from. It comes from German. I knew that, but. Gain means against. Oh, it means exactly the same thing. Yeah. There we go. So larger ions are more tightly, um, are, sorry, more, larger ions are more able to diffuse the negative charge around their large bulk and therefore they don't remain as closely associated with the growing chain end because the electrostatic potential of a large ion is lower than the electrostatic potential energy of a small ion with the same charge because charges like to spread out. They spread out um, in order to reduce their electrostatic uh, potential energy. Okay, so larger ions are less tightly bound and produce greater propagation rate constants. So they're less tightly bound. Why would this matter? The less tightly bound, so if they float away a little bit farther or for longer, then more counter ions, or sorry, more monomers have time and space to sneak in there and add to the growing chain. And the counter ion floats away farther and for longer if it's bigger because it's not as attracted to the positive charge of the growing chain end. Is that okay? Similarly, uh, there's a, uh, a, an important role of the solvent. 
and particularly its dielectric constant. So if the solvent has a high dielectric constant, it means it has a high density of dipoles and can screen charges. So if you have a high dielectric constant, then you can screen the charges between the positive growing chain end and the negative counter ion. They therefore can float away farther from each other in a high dielectric constant environment because the solvent molecules themselves lower the electrostatic potential energy and therefore the force of attraction between the growing polymer chain and the counter ion and more monomer molecules can find their way to the growing chain end in order to increase the length of the chain. So high dielectric constant means faster reaction. So high dielectric constant masks the electrostatic interaction between the uh, growing chain end and the counter ion. So it allows, so therefore, so therefore monomers add faster. Let's look at an example where we precisely tune the dielectric constant of the solvent and let's see what happens to the reaction rate constant. So let's see, let's look at the solvent, the dielectric constant, and the reaction rate constant Kp in units of liters per mole per second. And if we start with carbon tetrachloride, polar or not polar? Not polar, so high or low dielectric constant? low dielectric constant. What do you need for a high dielectric constant? You need a dipole moment and you need, you don't have to have a high dipole moment. You don't have, you, you, you don't have to have a dipole. You have to have a high dipole moment to have a high dielectric constant. Uh, but you also need your mole the molecule to be small because the density of strong dipole of high dipole moments in a solvent or any medium is what gives it its dielectric constant. So carbon tetrachloride has uh, a dielectric constant of 2.3. What's the lowest a dielectric constant can be? One. Dielectric constant could be one, which is what air or vacuum is. And it's not it's not one, it's a little higher than one because you can still polarize the electrons just because they're not totally stuck to the protons. You can still polarize this molecule in an electric field. So the dielectric constant is not as low as it, as, as, is not as low as, as vacuum, but it's pretty low. Uh, and the reaction rate constant is 0.0012. Now let's take uh, 40% 40, um, 40 carbon tetrachloride and 60% CH2Cl taken twice. 
which is um, uh, dichloroethane. And this has now a dipole moment. So we have added something that's totally miscible with this solvent, but now we have a little bit of it that has a dipole moment. So the dielectric constant goes up by, uh, by a little bit, but the reaction rate constant goes up by a huge amount. Now let's increase the amount of uh, a dichloroethane to 80%. Dielectric constant is now 7.0, and the reaction rate is now 3.2. Now we have pure dichloroethane, dielectric constant of 9.7, and the reaction rate constant goes all the way up to 17.0. So this is a modest increase. in dielectric constant, and you get a huge increase in reaction rate constant. So I'm not going to derive all the kinetic rate laws. I'm just going to give you the, uh, the final result from the steady state kinetics uh, arguments. Your propagation rate is equal to some propagation rate uh, constant times the monomer concentration times the concentration of the growing chain ends. Or in terms of all reaction rate constants, your propagation rate constant times the initiation rate constant over the termination rate constant times the catalyst concentration. Times the monomer constant or monomer concentration. We can also define a kinetic chain length. which because we can't have combination for two positive charges like we can for radicals, the, the kinetic chain length is always the same as the number average degree of polymerization x sub n, which is the number of uh, monomers um, added per unit time over the number of chains formed per unit time, just as it was before. which is equal to kp over kt times the monomer uh, concentration. Okay, in addition to polymerizing alkenes, you can also polymerize ring-like structures to give you long chains of, of stuff that have a heteroatom along the, the chain. Heteroatom is an atom that's not carbon or hydrogen. Yeah. Yes. If, yeah, if, if combination were allowed, which it weren't, which it is not, which it weren't, which it is not, then you would still see uh, a kinetic chain length that was 
half of the number average degree polymerization for combination, but you can't have combination here. So don't worry about it. But with the other kind, But with radicals, you do. So ring opening polymerization. or ROP. There's also a ring opening metathesis polymerization or ROMP. And you can polymerize things like uh, ethylene oxide uh, ethylene imine Tetrahydrofuran. So this type of, of structure, and how does this work? Well, if we have a the simplest epoxide we can possibly have, which is just ethylene oxide. Epoxide is a triangle with an oxygen in it. plus R plus A minus, where R plus could be either H plus the initiator, or it could be the growing chain end. What we do, because we have these juicy lone pairs of electrons on the oxygen atom, these will, uh, will attack the R plus to give us And another monomer comes in, and this positive charge is actually delocalized among this, across this entire structure. And the most reactive uh, atom is actually this one. And the ring opens thusly. You will never be asked in the class to draw, to push, push electrons using arrows but I'm just telling you where they, where they end up. Then you have this structure, and ultimately what you end up with is Is polyethylene uh, oxide? Question. Yep. That positive charge belongs on the oxygen and not the R, right? Uh, it belongs on. It can. It can go. It can resonate between several of the atoms in the structure. I'm actually. I'll do a supplement lecture this week, like just a five minute thing on resonance structures and why positive charges end up where they do. But suffice it to say that this is always the most, uh, that this is always the most reactive um, carbon atom in this structure. I actually have a, a page of the notes, page 4.0 in the notes that I wasn't planning on, on covering in class, but I will probably record it because it, it's got some supplemental stuff that you don't, strictly speaking, need to know, but would be helpful if you haven't seen it before. OK, how about, uh, how about anionic polymerization, which is actually quite a bit more useful than cationic polymerization, in that it allows us the ability to make um, to make a wide uh, range of, of polymeric structures like block copolymers, 
and uh, and uh, and other uh, other more complicated architectures. But the problem with it is that it's completely sensitive to water. So even the the protons on the water molecule are acidic enough to be attacked by the negative charge at the growing polymer chain end to terminate the reaction. So anionic polymerization almost always starts with some alkyl lithium uh, uh, reagent. And the alkyl lithium reagent could be like butyl lithium, uh, for example, which are uh, can be dangerous to use um, in the lab. So much to the point where this guy, which is tert <coughs> butyl lithium, is extraordinarily uh, flammable, or if you have it in a syringe, and in the ambient environment, if you squirt it out of the syringe, it creates a stream of fire. We will not be doing that. In fact, it's banned from our lab. Um, because there's always another way to do, to do something. I know that some hardcore organic chemists will not agree, but people like die every year in labs uh, from mishandling of, uh, of butyl lithium reagents. Particularly T-butyl. If you use N-butyl, it's way less reactive. Um, and n-butyl lithium is more than sufficient to initiate most of these uh, most of these reactions. So what you get um, is the negative charge here because this uh, this group is um, is an electron withdrawing group instead of an electron donating group. It's an electron withdrawing group. Gives this carbon atom a partial positive charge, which wants to be attacked by this negative charge. So now we have, uh, we have a new alkyl lithium, but now the new alkyl lithium is, um, is the growing chain end. And we can add this to another monomer to give us Now this species that we're left with in the end that says propagation although well, it doesn't look like anything that says propagation believe me believe me folks if you you'll be stuck here forever unless you end the reaction. So cationic polymerizations will, uh, will terminate by... Uh, um, a cationic polymerizations will, uh, will terminate either unimolecularly or bimolecularly. And anionic polymerizations are stuck like this forever until you quench them uh, with, uh, with water. So this is so this is uh, totally uh, totally living, whereas I forgot to say something important about cationic polymerization. I hope you can squeeze this into your notes. Um, this is uh, termination. termination of cationic uh, polymerization okay so we can 
either eliminate this uh, hydrogen atom or this uh, hydrogen uh, this hydrogen ion and take this lone pair or this pair of electrons and satisfy this charge with the loss of the uh, of the hydrogen in which case the product is this plus regeneration of our acid catalyst and this is unimolecular termination but you can also have a scenario in which this monomer, instead of reacting with this positive charge, bites off this hydrogen atom, in which case you have the same product. The, the polymer chain terminates in the same way, but now you have this monomer that's now now has a now has a positive uh, charge on it and this is bimolecular termination okay maybe it wasn't so bad that i mentioned this now because i mean to contrast this case where these can happen these steps can happen at any time and give you kind of an uncontrolled character to the cationic polymerization, whereas there's no way for that to happen with the anionic polymerization. This is, uh, this is sitting pretty here forever until we add in some water to quench the reaction. Then the reaction chains are terminated. Yeah? When you say something is living, it means it's still like uh, reacting or resonating? It still has the ability to be reactive. If we add in more monomers, this chain will continue to get longer. So anionic polymerization is actually quite like um, controlled radical polymerization in that, uh, in that once all the monomers are consumed, you still have these reactive chain, uh, chain ends. And if you add in more monomers uh, to them, then you, can, uh, then you can make block copolymers and other more interesting uh, architectures. Okay, back to anionic. Your reactor or reaction flask must be assiduously dry. So no water on the sidewalls uh, at all. This is anionic again. Terminated by any H2O, even even accidental. Again, the rate increases with the polarity of the solvent. And that is, again, because it allows the counter ion, in this case the lithium plus, to dissociate farther away from the growing chain end and more monomers can come in. Is that a way of restating what we said earlier about dielectric constant? Yes, yeah. Uh, polarity of solvent. They're not exactly the same thing because dielectric constant also means the smallness of the of the solvent dielectric constant is probably a more precise way of saying this but they pretty much 
will increase together for all intents and purposes with uh, small solvent molecules. And X should be electron withdrawing like the nitrile or cyano uh, group. or a, uh, any carbonyl group, C double bond O, these structures tend to suck in electron density and give you a structure that makes this carbon atom receptive toward attack by negatively charged species. You can also have anionic ring opening Say again, we have ethylene oxide plus some potassium alk oxide, uh, alkoxide uh, reagent. And this gives us. this structure, which can then react with another species. And after many steps, we get the polymer. which is again polyethylene oxide, but in this case we've made it in a living way by anionic polymerization as opposed to by cationic polymerization. And because I realized that electron withdrawing and electron donating may not be clear uh, at this point, that's totally fine if this is new language, so we'll start there on Wednesday to clear up any questions about what constitutes electron donating electron withdrawing, and then we'll finish up chemistry forever, for the rest of the course, at the end of the day on, uh, on Wednesday. Unless you